winter has arrived guys so what's winter got to do with us well it's got to do with the workshop and the workshop is cold so look what we got here what's going on guys my name is Brandon and if you're a regular viewer of this channel you'll know that recently I've just started doing my own service work and maintenance on my oil fired boiler you can see right over my shoulder here that's from a previous video or if you're new here maybe this will give you the confidence to tackle some of these jobs now this type of heating system is very common in the Northeast my shop gets a little chilly so I figured this would be a great alternative I got the supplies from a company called supply house I ordered it all online it's where I got all the other supplies for the previous videos I had such a good experience I reached out to them for this project so I figured this would be a great opportunity to do a full, complete, detailed install. I'll explain basic boiler principles. I will install the heater, plumb up the pipe, and show you a bunch of the controls. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a boiler expert. I do have a little bit of knowledge because, as you know, I'm trying to educate myself. I do have a formal education in electrical and electronics, so I think that'll help me there. As far as everything else, just like you guys, I'm learning as I go, so I'm hopefully going to put in something very detailed that'll show somebody who's looking to do this, uh, that they can have all the basic knowledge that they need in one place to maybe do this for themselves. So let's get going. So this here is what's called a unit heater, or in my instance, a hydronic unit heater. This is a 33,000 uh, BTU unit, and here are the details on that. But before we get into opening this up, I want to explain a little bit about the functions of this and how, and how a hydronic system works. There's a thermostat mounted on the wall. When the thermostat senses that it needs heat, it fires up this burner, which heats up the water inside this boiler. The boiler temperature is set by that, which is called the aquastat, and you're going to hear that in this video again very soon. It turns on one of these, which is called a circulator. That circulator pumps heated hot water. It's under 200 degrees throughout the registers or radiators or baseboard heat in the house, and that provides the heat for the house. So what we are gonna do today is come off this existing and add another zone. There'll be another circulator, more piping, and it's gonna go out to that unit heater in the workshop. If you guys attempt to try this uh, project, there's electrical involved and there's plumbing involved. Just make sure that you're doing it legally uh, because some, uh, some areas you may be doing this illegally if you're working on your own stuff. Uh, just check into it. Oh, and there's the business end of that. So let's get, get the cardboards out of there. Wow, she's just a little guy. Even came with a uh, installation and service manual. Let me just go over this real quick without spending a lot of time. So inside here, our coils, as you can see. It's got connections here, inlets and outlets. And on the back side, it's got a fan. The way this works is that water enters, hot water enters, goes through the coils, comes back out, returns back to the boiler. It just keeps making a loop. When the thermostat calls for heat, it heats up the water, sends it through the coils, returns it back to the boiler so it can be heated up again. I'm going to control this electric motor using an aquastat. I'm going to have it so that when the sensor senses that the water is up to a predetermined temperature, the fan will turn on. When the water gets below that set temperature, the fan will turn off. What that'll do is that'll prevent this fan from running when the water isn't hot enough in that coil. Because if it's not hot water in the coil, it's just gonna blow cold air through it. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna mount it right there uh, in that corner. Uh, I've got a piece of angle iron. I think we'll use that as a hanger. And then it's got some uh, threaded, uh, threaded nuts in here. So we'll just hang it off some threaded rod into this. And then we'll mount this up into the ceiling. Let's get going. So to buy these little rubber grommets, and grommets are made for like passing wires through uh, openings, but I just use these grommets as uh, vibration dampeners. Now, to buy these at your local hardware store uh, or big box store, it's going to cost you like a small fortune to buy them individually. I bought this whole uh, assortment pack uh, for like $4 or something like that at Harbor Freight. So 
you can buy these uh, rubber isolation mounts that are made specifically for uh, fans and mounting equipment but you know in true Lund DIY fashion I wanted to uh, fabricate something out of it and it wasn't all that difficult and it didn't take a whole lot of time so now all I'm doing here is uh, just painting it up and I figured rather than take it apart and all that just tape it off and paint it in place it was just as easy and uh, these work really well There, check it out, it's all mounted. Now all you do is just get it piped up. And that is a simple way to add isolation and dampening to your heater. And it totally isolates this from the floor above. Now that we got the unit mounted, it's time to get this thing plumbed up. Here's a list of all the supplies. I'll hold it there just for a second. That I purchased for this, I got everything through uh, supply house except for uh, the pipe which I got local so and look at all this stuff so we got everything guys like I said I'm doing an all new zone I got a new circulator uh, thermostat you can get everything uh, all in one place I got this control that's going to be interesting to see how that works so let's get going let's get this thing plumbed up and uh, see if we can get some heat in the workshop now for this pipe here guys I'm using what's called type L they make uh, a couple different types. Type M is a little bit thinner wall than Type L. Type L is considered a heavy duty copper and that's what I'm using for all of this. You know, It's one of those things that I could buy Type M and save you know a little bit of money in the in the beginning but this isn't anything I want to go replacing sometime soon so you know might as well buy the the heavy duty stuff and then it's you know good forever and I never have to worry about it when you cut your fittings too you always want to uh, ream the back side out just a good idea to to get that burr out of there that's what that little tool on the back side of the cutter does so the next thing we got to do is clean up all our fittings now one thing that always stuck with me that when I was taught how to solder and do plumbing this brush normally you would use and you just clean your fittings like this you know you stick the brush in you turn it kind of labor intensive not bad if you're just doing one but if you're doing a bunch here's a great tip to save you a little bit of a little bit of time cut it off okay chuck it in a cordless now you can clean your fittings real fast saves a lot of time cleaning fittings. Making sure that your fittings are extremely clean is the key to having a good solder joint. Then I just use a piece of emery, emery paper and clean up the pipe. They make uh, brushes that fit over, it's like a tube brush that fit over the pipe, similar idea to the fitting brush. I just never had good luck with those. They seem like they wear out uh, really fast and for the price of them, I just soon use, uh, soon use this stuff, the emery paper. There, now that our fittings are clean, now we just wipe on some flux paste and we're going to put that on the fittings and on the pipe. You don't have to go too nuts with this stuff but just coat it evenly. Stuff is cold so it's kind of working a little difficult. You see kind of how I made a mess all around the outside of the fitting? I found that once I get all this assembly put together that if I wipe the extra flux off around it it'll make for a cleaner job because the solder will go wherever the flux is. You 
and you don't want a sloppy job. You want to, you know, the goal is to have a nice, neat looking uh, solder joint. Now this could all be done with uh, PEX tubing also and PEX fittings. The only reason I'm doing it with copper is uh, basically that's because what I know, you know, is what I was taught and what I was brought up with. But you know, I think you might be able to save quite a bit of time by using PEX because you're not doing all this uh, soldering. But the issue is I don't have any PEX tools either. So if I went to go with PEX, I'd have to you know, buy all the tools or find someone with all the tools. I don't know how it compares out uh, price-wise, PEX to copper. I would have to probably guess that it's probably quite a bit more money uh, doing all copper fittings and all copper pipe. That's what I did here. And everything uh, that I have is all copper. I don't have anything that's, that's PEX. But you know, if you guys are familiar with PEX, feel free to go ahead and use it. And you see what I'm doing here is uh, I'm just heating up the fitting and I try to apply the solder on the opposite side of where I apply the heat. So you heat the fitting and, uh, and you heat the pipe a little bit too, but you heat the pipe and you heat the fitting, you apply more heat to the fitting and then I just wipe off the uh, solder joint with a piece of fiberglass insulation. So for the folks that are new to plumbing here, um, what you're trying to do is you're just trying to do a real nice neat job as well. Uh, you don't want big globs of solder everywhere because it doesn't look good uh, for one. It just looks sloppy. Uh, so you want to try to you know make sure your work stays nice and clean and uh, do what you can do to you know wipe off the excess solder. For you guys that may be watching this that are plumbers uh, that do this every day, I'm sure you guys can do a much better job than I'm doing right now. I don't do this every day, so um, you know, so obviously somebody who does this for a living is going to do a much better job than myself, but um, you know, I'm trying hard to keep my work neat and, and to make it look good. Now, I don't know if this is um, all that necessary, but it's kind of what I was taught, so that's kind of what I do. I do uh, Teflon tape and then uh, pipe dope. I could probably just do pipe dope and it'd probably be just fine but like I said I'm not I'm not a plumber so you know I, I I'll do everything I gotta do even if it's a little bit of an extra step just to ensure that I don't have a problem you know so I'll explain why I'm doing these things here that I'm doing uh, what this is gonna be is if I ever want to service that heater and it's got to be taken apart that'll allow me to drain that heater and this allows also act like a purge station and I'm going to show you when we get to doing that uh, that I'll actually be able to burp some of the air out of that heater through this this is the supply side that I'm putting on here and you don't have to guess whether you should put it on the top or the bottom uh, the directions that came with it said that for a hot water system the supply needs to go on the bottom so one of the things that I picked up was this uh, washing machine hose. Now the reason I did that is so that I can screw the end of this hose on to the end of this fitting. It's going to have valves up here, so I'm going to sh I can shut the return off and pump out air right through this easily just to help burp some of the air off. So that's why I got that washing machine fitting. And plus, if I have one to drain it or to service it. Now here I'm just making up the return line, trying to solder up as much as I can, you know, down at a comfortable level on the bench, and then put the assembly together overhead. Now, one thing to remember when you're working with uh, thread tape is that it is directional. You want to spin it on the way I'm spinning it on now, so that as you tighten the fitting into what you're screwing it into, that it's not unscrewing the thread tape. You want to make sure that you wrap it in the right direction. So the great thing about that website uh, where I got all this stuff at Supply House is that they have a lot of technical information there too uh, that can kind of help you out if you're not sure. So one thing I wanted to do, you know, obviously I want to do things the right way. Um, 
So there's a little bit of controversy on, you know, how do you solder a valve properly? Do you solder it with a valve open? Do you solder it with a valve closed? Um, well, it's easy to find out because you can go right onto their website and they have a thing called technical data and you can download or even view the technical data for these valves and they recommend that when you solder them you solder it with the ball valve at a 45 degree angle and you concentrate your heat to this uh, onto the pipe and work it onto the to the flange of the valve so pretty self-explanatory it's kind of nice that uh, that they have that alright let's get it soldered Now you don't want to spend a lot of time on these valves because there's a uh, the seat that's in there. You don't want to go uh, ruining it, you know, melting it. So you kind of want to get on and get off. Don't spend a lot of time. So now that we got the valve soldered on to the return line, I'm going to put a vent in it. Now this is an automatic vent. Uh, it's made by uh, Watts and what that's going to do is that's going to just make it easier down the road to purge air out of this. And the way these work uh, is you just, there's like a little float inside and you keep this closed. Uh, for now just to keep uh, crap from getting in it and when you're ready to charge up the system you just open this up and you leave it open just a little bit and any air that accumulates because this is the high point this is the high point of this assembly it'll uh, just automatically drain off any uh, any air that that's in that line and just it makes it that much easier uh, to service this wasn't a whole lot of money for this little for this little vent thing well worth the, uh, you know, like I said, again, there's all kinds of ways you could do this. And I'm not saying that the way that I'm doing this is the uh, perfect way or the right way. Or, you know, people that do this every day for a living, you'll have probably all kinds of ideas of, uh, of how to do it. But I'm just looking at this from a standpoint of, you know, down the road, someone else may have to work on this. And I want it easy for them. Uh, to be able to service this and if I have to do it I certainly want it easy for me I don't want to have to uh, you know sh struggle and you know that's why I'm doing the union so that all this could come apart and this heater could be taken down the valve can be closed without having to dig into the boiler and all you need to do here is just snug it up tight as you can get it by hand and you're good there let's put this on then we're ready to just come out and head to the boiler with this there now that any air that gets trapped in here will automatically vent out through the top piece of cake so now that we got the heater done I think what we're gonna do is we'll start over at the boiler and we'll start plumbing everything up over there and we'll bring it back over to here so I think that'll just be cleaner be easier to match everything up so so with this I'm not doing zone valves I'm doing a circulator pump and I'm matching everything that I have uh, already so it should everything should interchange if they could and it should look all like the same original installation so for a pump I'm using a grunt post circulator that's what what I have on there already and when you buy these they come with the gaskets already which is kind of nice and these right here these uh, webstone flange valves 
they, they're going to allow me to shut the pump off on either side. So if one of these ever burnt out, you could uh, shut it down on either side of this circulator. And that way you can just replace the circulator without having to bleed the lines. It, it'd just be this little section right here that would have air in it. And these pumps are directional. They show you which, uh, where the flow goes, and there's a check valve inside of them also that I guess keeps the fluid from going backwards maybe. But I'm just making the arrows go the way all the others are going right now. This is the direction of the flow. The fluid comes through this way towards me. So when my wife and I originally had this put in, we thought that we may want to add additional zones. So at the time we said, yeah, go ahead and, uh, you know, add additional provisions. So that made it easy here. We could add up to, a, you know, a couple, couple circulators additional. So I'm thankful that we had the forethought to, uh, to do that. So now we just put on our gasket. Pretty foolproof, I think. As long as I don't drop the nut. There we go. We'll just close this for now. And then this three-quarter inch male adapter threads right into the end of that. And then we just, boom, we send it off over to the uh, supply side in the workshop. Easy as pie. So now I'm just measuring everything out so I can work on getting my hangers installed in the ceiling. Now what that's called there is called a van hanger. Now, in hindsight, what I probably would have done if I had to do it again is use uh, like a, it's called a PEX hanger. Uh, it's made to suspend PEX from the ceiling. I'd probably do that. Uh, and it, I think it's a lot less money too. Uh, and the reason I do that is that the PEX hanger is made like of a plastic or a rubber and it's going to, uh, vibration dampening, it's just going to work a lot better. Uh, and those van hangers are a little bit more money and it's a little more time consuming the other clips are just a lot easier to do so if I had to do it again that's probably what I would do now here I'm just putting together some of the return piping and all in all this went together pretty slick I was quite happy with how this worked out and just heating up the fittings and you know, I'm not getting too in-depth on soldering everything but I'm just trying to give you kind of an overview of what I'm working on you don't need to see me you know solder every joint so now that I got the supply piped or started, now I'm going to start the return. Check out this guys. This pipe was just made in Canada on January 23rd of this year. That's good. We don't want stale pipe. I'll leave a link down in the description where I got all this stuff for Supply House. But their website is really easy to use and navigate around. And they got a lot of information on there that I found useful. They had a bunch of calculators for like uh, figuring out how much you know radiant heat supplies you need or PEX tubing, boiler calculations, you know how much baseboard heat you need. Just a lot of information. They got a bunch of tutorial videos. Uh, you guys should check it out. All right, so it's run from the boiler all the way down so that's coming down going into the bottom of the heater and goes through the heater comes back out hits that vent goes back to the boiler to be reheated and do it all over again all right we're ready to fill that line so we'll turn off the boiler this is the automatic feeder right here so just so you guys get an idea what's going on the water line is coming in, goes up, it's going to go down, boom, it's going to stop here. 
because I'm going to shut that valve off. I'm going to shut this, which is one of the zones. I'm going to shut this, which is another one of the zones. So now the water is going to come in, feed, can't go out there now, it can't go out there now, but it will go out here once I turn this on. And then it'll run through the circulator. I'll turn this back on. Then the water will start filling up all the way back to the workshop. It'll come back on this line, but it won't be able to go back in to the return because I'm going to have it off. So we'll let the air out here. But right now I'm just going to charge it up and see what happens. So here we go. Here's the first one. Okay, so there's that. I'm just going real slow in case there's an issue with that uh, automatic feeder. All right, well, what we'll do is we'll go in the workshop and uh, open up a valve. It doesn't look like we have any leaks right now. We've got water right to here. So now I'm going to turn on this valve. It'll put water through the coil back up to this vent and it'll stop at the return. You can hear the vent purging off air. Now we'll turn on the return. That's why I picked up a washing machine hose. So I can just screw it on this. This is going to act kind of like a purge station. We're just going to crack this and start letting some air out, which is going to allow more water in. Can you hear the water moving? Well, we need to do this until the water runs clear with no air bubbles. And that is it guys. These lines are fully charged. Not even a drip, which is uh, for me a little unusual. I mean, not even the unions had like a little drip. It was actually just right out of the gate. It worked great. So I'm super excited. So for you guys with a hydronic boiler, this is a great alternative to get some heat uh, out either to your garage or your workshop or whatever you have, or even a basement area. Um, this stuff works great. So stay tuned next week and we're going to go over all the controls in depth. Uh, and it's not overly complicated, but I figured I would explain it out because there isn't a whole lot on the internet about it. So I want to thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you're wondering what I'm working on before it even makes it up to YouTube. You guys can check me on Instagram and on Facebook. Till next week, guys. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. If it's something that you like, give it a thumbs up. See ya. Bye.